Abdul Salam with BeatsBoxingMayhem.com and also Boxing Insider here with Showtime Sports President Stephen Espinoza. Thank you, Stephen, for making time. I know it's hectic during fight week. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's a little bit different fight week, different energy with the holidays, but uh, right. it's exciting. So my first question for you, you just mentioned it's the holidays. So one thing I was concerned about was what the turnout was going to be right after Christmas. Mm-hmm. I figured that would be a risk, but so far the sales have been going good. What made you so confident that the sales would be good even during Christmas we would well, tank? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I, when it comes to that in this particular weekend, uh, I relied on someone you know with more experience than me. Um, Al Heyman and I were talking, and he had mentioned that uh, in Atlanta in particular, whenever the calendar fell so that there was a weekend between Christmas and New Year's, mm-hmm. he always did big concert business in Atlanta. Okay. Because people might you know have some days off, they're looking for something to do, they've been at home, they've been with family, maybe they're looking to get out. Mm-hmm. So when there's a weekend in between Christmas and New Year's, it's generally been a good weekend in the market. Now, it hasn't been a boxing weekend, so it's a little bit of risk. But uh, so far, you know, it's, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that knowledge has sort of transferred. You know, big, good concert weekend, also good boxing weekend, as it turns out. Right, right. So looking at Tank, you know, he's on the cusp of actually really becoming a superstar. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed was, you know, you did a lot of great work with Deontay Wilder Mm -hmm. when he was coming up. Is there any concern with Tank and also with Fox as them coming in, what they did with Deontay, maybe trying to get a pay-per-view? Any worry about any other networks trying to swoop in with the work that you're doing yeah, with Tank? Yeah, look, the, the, the reality is you know, there's always competition. Right. Um, and whether it's HBO or Fox or mm-hmm. who knows who it's going to be in the future. Right. So, you know, the reality is Showtime Boxing has been around for almost 35 years. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, we love to work with fighters all, their whole career, Badu Jack. Right. It's basically been nowhere other than, than Showtime. Mm-hmm. Tank has been nowhere other than Showtime. You know, the Charlos up until last year, nowhere other than Showtime. Right. Um, but, you know, as much as we, you know, um, want to continue with, with Deontay, mm-hmm. um, you know, this is a franchise, you know, and we we are in the business of, of helping build stars. Right. So, you know, unfortunately, look, people have to make business decisions, and sometimes that means, you know, we have Canelo for a few fights, and then it right. takes a different. We never like that to happen, mm-hmm. but you know the franchise continues, and we continue to discover new stars. So at a certain point, um, you know we can even look at it with with Floyd. You know, were we disappointed when Floyd retired and you know hasn't come back? You know, sure, right. but it also gives us capability to discover guys like Tank. Mm-hmm. You know, it gives us another so. Look, I, I'm, I'm not saying I would trade a Deontay or a Tank for, you know, for a up and coming guy. Right. But that's the business that we're in, and that's why boxing fans love the sport. Is there's always a next guy coming up. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the great fights that you have coming up with Showtime. All of them are going to be on regular Showtime. Where do you see pay-per-view as a tool for Showtime in 2020? Do you think it will be utilized, or do you think you can put it on the back burner for most of the year? You know, I I think the right um, number is probably a couple pay-per-views because, Mm -hmm. you know, I, um, you know, sometimes there's grumbling for pay-per-views, but I think in general, um, people don't mind paying it when it's when it's worth when it's right. deserved um you know you have a bunch of friends over sometimes you know they bring the beer you pay for the the fight or everybody chips in mm-hmm. the reality it's it's part of the experience um yes it's 75 bucks and that's not an easy expense you know all the time but if you're getting a big fight in a quality card you know then you know i think it's the right tool the problem is is when you start using that as a financial crunch, right? You know, and uh, toward the end, for example, HBO put a bunch of fights on pay per view because they didn't have the budget to put them on HBO. Right. Now, if they're not pay per view quality cards, it shouldn't be on pay per view. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it shouldn't be looking to just make a, a profit. You know, pay per view is to make fights happen that couldn't otherwise happen. Okay. And you know, I think. You know, sort of, I can't tell you exactly how many because it depends what fights get made. And if a fight deserves to be on pay per view, it will be. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that there are, you know, I've seen some people saying, look, we'd like to do four to six pay per views, you know, a year Mm -hmm. on one network. Um, 
if you're at four, five, six pay-per-views a year, um, plus you know whatever other networks are doing, that that's not a good thing for the sport. That, right. That's just essentially trying to make money off the sport, mm -hmm. and boxing fans are going to recognize that and see through it. One criticism I hear from boxing fans is they say, and it's it's funny. They say that the fighters are getting overpaid, and because they're getting overpaid, they're getting lazy, and they're not being as active as they need to be. As an executive, what do you? What's your response to a criticism like that? Well, um, I, I agree partially and disagree. You know, part, you know, I don't think um, there's a problem necessarily with fighters not fighting enough, mm -hmm. um, especially at the championship level. Right. I mean, look, we saw Errol and Sean Porter in an absolute war for 12 months. So right. put the car crash aside. You know, if you ask me for their health, they shouldn't be in the ring for another six months. Mm. Right. You know, I don't think that's that's one where you turn around and put either guy in a fight four months later. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, does that mean that maybe Errol and Sean might fight twice a year mm -hmm. in the near future? Look, if you're fighting two wars like that, twice a year is plenty. Right. You know, because, I, you know, again, I, you know, there's been... We've seen it, um, you know, at least with, you know, some of the tragedies in the ring. You can point to guys who've been taking fights, you know, every six weeks or eight weeks. Right. You know, at the end of the day, I don't want to pretend I know, you know, all I have all the medical data, but mm -hmm. I'd rather err on the side of you know, being a little more cautious than not. Right. Um, so at the championship level, I don't have any any problem with a guy fighting twice a year or tank, you know, three times a year. Mm -hmm. um, now, you bring up the money. You know, the complaint I agree with in a different sort of way is we now have outlets that are getting into the sport mm -hmm. and they're making offers either, you know, simply because they need fighters and they need content. Right. And there's not, there's not any quality control. There's not any interest in quality mm -hmm. control. So there's a number of fighters. Tank in particular, Tank's got it, Charlo's got it, the other guy. They get offers all the time from other networks that say, hey, here's $7 million, you can fight whoever you want. Hmm. You okay. know, literally, whoever you want. Now, the problem with that is, it, it makes my job harder because you've got a guy, um, you've got a whole range of guys, you know, and they're getting, well, you can go fight on this network for a million dollars, fight whoever you want. Mm -hmm. Go fight on that work, a million dollars, whoever you want. My offer is you can fight for a million dollars and you've got to take a real, real meaningful fight. Right. So if there's only one guy in, in, in the, the business doing that, then it becomes harder because every fighter can look at it and say, look, ah, you know, at the end of the day, I can go over here and fight Joe Schmo for a million dollars or I can fight on Showtime and you know, I'm going to fight a much tougher fight for the same money. Right. Now, the guys that we end up doing business with choose to make that because of the benefits that come with being on Showtime mm -hmm. and the benefits that come to their career of taking those kind of fights. Because the other thing that we've seen, with this amount of boxing in the market and this amount of sports programming, you know, fights that are not competitive, that are not meaningful, you know, are a tree falling in the forest. Right. Like, you know, if you're not fighting, if you're fighting mismatch after mismatch, if you're fighting, you know, all these, no one's going to pay attention. There's too much boxing on the air mm -hmm. for people to pay attention to fights that don't mean anything. Right. So at the end of the day, look, taking that money and going against an opponent, it's sort of, you know, penny wise, pound foolish. It's a short term decision. Right. But in terms of career development, exposure, you know, that's certainly not the way to go in my opinion. Now, you mentioned how segregated the boxing scene is being now, especially at the um, platforms, all the platforms that we have coming out now. I just always wonder how often, if any, contact do you have with those other networks? Is it only when there's a potential fight on the table, or do you guys kind of keep in contact just to see what the playing field is going to be like in the next couple months? No, we, we, we don't. I mean, look, um, there are events where we run into each other, you mm -hmm. know, boxing riders dinner or right. things like that. And there's a there's a courtesy with this sport, but we really don't communicate mm. except for those rare occasions where it makes sense and when we need to. Right. And, and you know, I think at a certain point there needs to be more of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've demonstrated the ability that when there's a big fight to be made, 
you know, we will cross lines and do something unusual mm-hmm. in order to give fans what they want. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we haven't seen that very often, or certainly not as much from other outlets. Mm-hmm. So, at the end of the day, you know, I think, you know, the sport would benefit from everyone being a little bit more open to doing that when necessary to get things to do it. And I think, you know, uh, some sometimes what you're seeing is a lot of public talk about desire to make a fight mm-hmm. that doesn't match up with what's actually happening behind the scenes. Right. So the one thing about it is the network conflict is an easy scapegoat. Mm-hmm. You know, if a promoter or fighter doesn't really want to take a fight or has the reasons for not taking a fight, the network thing is an easy one to say, oh, well, they're a different network. Okay. That's not often the case because the number of times when the fighter and the promoter is saying publicly, you know, I'm screaming for that fight, I want that fight. And behind the scenes, I know they're doing next to nothing to actually make it happen. Right. You know, that's really where the proof is in the pudding. I want to touch on something you mentioned earlier. Now, I do have to say, full disclosure, neither of us are medical professionals, but sure. you mentioned that the damage, you have to be careful with bringing fighters back. When you look at the older fighters, you know, you see, it sounds crazy now, like Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta mm-hmm. fighting three times in the span of a month. Right. Do you think the reason why it's so much, it seems more debilitating now is because the fighters are bigger and stronger, or do you think it's because all the weight classes and the draining a, makes us more susceptible it's a, it's to injury? A good, it's a good question. Um, it's a really good question. I think we have to remember that not all the damage is done in the fight. Sure. There's a lot of damage that's done in sparring. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think there's no way to really tell this, but, uh, you, know, you know, it'd be interesting if it were possible to look at how often those fighters are sparring right. versus how they are today. Mm-hmm. I also think, and again, I'm not pointing to anyone in particular, right. but we also have to keep in mind you know, PEDs and artificial performance. Sure. Because again, that doesn't just affect performance in the ring. If you're taking things that allow you to train longer and harder, Mm -hmm. that also means you are putting out more damage and taking more damage. So if you are now able physically to spar 15 rounds instead of 10, that's five more rounds of damage you're taking, your sparring partners are taking. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of dominoes that have effects that we don't really know about, you know. But I, I think you know one one thing that I, you know I think you know Lou DeBella said this a while back, and I, I agree with him, is you know we have to look at just the, not safety during the fight itself, mm-hmm. but our practices in sparring and the, the training methods to make sure that we're not creating a lot of the problems there in sparring that become only obvious in a fight itself. Gotcha. So let's assume everything goes fantastic, sell out mm-hmm. crowd on Saturday. You have Clarissa Shields, you have other fighters on deck. Who would be the next fighter you would want to bring down to Atlanta that you think would be great for this market? Look, I, I mean, the, the the three, you know, when, when we're building a market, at least our theory has been, it helps to have someone who's got a connection to the city right. and who's marketable and likable and charismatic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the three fighters on the top I had that have the, the biggest connection to a city, you know, are, you know, Tank having moved here and being a young star. Right. Broner, who's, you know, spent a lot of time here. Mm-hmm. Um, and Deontay Wilder, you know, just a few hours away, in, you know, in Tuscaloosa. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those would be the prime candidates. But, look, there, there are also other options. Um, you know, the, the reality is there's some young guys, you know, Teron Ennis, is a young sure. fighter that, you know, he's got, he's from a city with a great boxing history, mm-hmm. but, you know, in Philly, um, but bringing him down to Atlanta, you know, he's a, an action fighter, a really likable, charismatic, you know, future star, we believe, you know, he's someone who you could bring back and build a fan base here as well as in Philly. Right. So I think it is, you know, not necessarily all African-American fighters, because I think the other thing that people don't realize about Atlanta, it's got a, a sort of underappreciated, you know, Latino population. Very true. You know, something that's grown a lot over the last decade. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I think we can probably, you know, bring, a, you know, some Latino fighters that would do surprisingly well here as well. Very true. All right, so my last question for you, being that Atlanta is big on hip-hop, yep. I do have to ask you, who would be your top five MCs for Steven Espinosa? Oh, ever? Wow. All man, time. See, I didn't Pick know. anybody. Um... See, this is going to date me. You're going to know what, what generation I came from. I got you. From. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I've got to go KRS. KRS, okay. Um, I've got to go Nas. That's my top. Um, you know, that's, you know, look, there, there are, when you ask this question, people fall in two camps. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're in a, a Biggie or a, a Tupac camp. Okay. True. I, I wouldn't, I'll put Biggie closer to my top five than Pac. Okay. But neither of them is in my top five. Okay. Um, Got him. So then, who else uh, goes in there? So I would probably say, um, you know, I, I struggle with Jay because I, <laughs> I mean, you know, look, when you when you 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 start with those two, right? You know, um, it's hard to put, you know. Jay Z in the same category as Nas and KRS. That's true. So I, I'd say Nas, KRS. I'd go with, um, you know, Rakim. Rakim, okay. You know, and again, generation, generationally, right? Um, you know, I, I think this will be a surprising one. I think LL is underappreciated. He's the first, like, the first superstar. Yeah. I mean, in, yeah. in terms of his early stuff, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know. I'm not going to, you know, go down with the ship on some of his later <laughs> right. stuff. Mm -hmm. But the first two or three albums, so there, there I'm up to four. Um, I think you got to go Chuck D. Chuck again, D. You know, so Very the, underrated these days. So, yeah. again, that's all generational. That's right. all that shows my age. But that that's my top five. Appreciate it. Steven, right, thank you, you for your time. Appreciate it.